My name is John Kachoyan. I'm the literary manager at Australian Plays. And as part of our Nimrod 50th celebrations, we're talking today to actor, director, and uh, one of the founding directors of Nimrod, John Bell. Uh, thanks for talking to us today, John. Pleasure, John. Um, so I suppose we're interested, obviously, as a playwriting organisation in the new writing output of Nimrod, um, which was equally significant, I think, as its explorations of classics and things. Was that ethos of, of new writing always part of the initial ideas for what the theatre was? I think uh, new writing was the, the wellspring of Nimrod. That's what it was all about. And I think that actually came out of um, productions that were happening at the, uh, the Jane Street Theatre, which was an adjunct of NIDA. I was working at NIDA, and um, I was offered a production at the Jane Street Theatre of a new Australian play. And my colleague at the time was Michael Boddy. He was teaching theatre history at NIDA. And we sifted through a whole lot of plays, and I didn't find any that were terribly appealing. And Body said, well, I'll, I'll write you one. So he wrote this piece called The Legend of King O'Malley, uh, with some help from Bob Ellis, and a lot of help from the actors involved. And that went on at Jane Street, and that was somehow seen as a bit of a breakthrough at the time, because it was very rough, irreverent, um, carnivalesque kind of piece, musical, slapstick. and. Um, uh, when Ken Hawler saw that, he approached me and said, I found this old stables in King's Cross. How would you feel about coming and working with me in this company? I was ready to leave NIDA. I did the one year and I was ready to leave. I didn't want to be a teacher anymore at that time. And that seemed a very attractive idea. So that particular production and that play really became, I suppose, the character of mm. Nimrod. That we were going to do stuff that was irreverent and musical and slapstick. It was all about house style and having fun. Not much to do with content, although there was always a soft, lefty, political kind of mm. content there somewhere. Um, and uh, so the first play we opened with was Biggles, again by Michael Boddy, which had a slightly sort of um, anti-colonialist, up the, up the Brits kind of uh, feel about it. And that was what the, the Nimrod sort of um, character uh, initially. Mm. Um, was that explicit d at the time? Did, was there a? Did people speak out loud about what that character might be, or it was just kind of assumed? Well, it, it, it kind of caught on. I mean, we weren't alone. I think um, the the Pram Factory in Melbourne had doing something similar, um, similar pieces like the Hills Family Show and those sort of pieces. But again, carnivalesque and burlesque and harking back to the old days of vaudeville. Mm. So there, that was that was in the air. There was also a, a, a reaction against what we thought was uh, a too conventional and too conservative theatre repertoire, where the most of the companies like the, the old Tote Theatre or the Melbourne, Melbourne Theatre Company, you'd have a, a Shaw and a Shakespeare and a, an O'Neill or a Molière. It, you know, respectable and uh, solid repertoire, but not much in the way of innovation mm. in terms of writing. So I think that's what we were um, hoping to... to um, kick some new life into the theatre mm. scene by doing this kind of theatre. Now eventually that ran its course. I think we soon found that house style and having fun and being irreverent wasn't quite enough. We actually needed some scripts <laughs> uh, and some decent scripts and intelligent writing um, rather than just sort of um, make it up on the as you go kind of theatre. And that's when we started to look for people like Romerill and Buzo um, and eventually David Williamson and we started to get really serious about new Australian content. Mm. What does that search look like? Is it just uh, sending out feelers, listening out for people in the ether? Well, or? it was looking around. I went down to Melbourne and uh, um, because I, I heard about this play, The Removalists, that was on down there at La Mama. So I went to see it and I thought it was terrific. So I said to David Williamson, who was actually playing The Removalist in that production, I'd like to take this play to Sydney. And so we did the deal on the spot. And I came back to Sydney and said, I've got this new, new Australian play. But until but before then, we'd had uh, some other uh, writers who were already established. Um, but then we looked for other people like John Wood, for instance, and um, we started with, and Ron Blair, who we knew from university days. We encouraged Ron to, to, um, to write for us. So we were out actually hawking, looking for mm. writers and encouraging people to bring us their stuff. And when those plays come in, or those initial drafts, you know, what is the 
was there any structure or system about how those plays were discussed or developed? I mean, Very little discussion. Yeah. I've got this hot new property, let's whack it on. Um, it was all pretty casual. Um, Ken Haller and myself were the two people sort of looking after the, the, the product, the repertoire as it were. Uh, and we were later joined by Richard Werrett. Um, and then later on in, down the track by Warren Nellor and Neil Armfield, Kim Carpenter. So there was always more than just one person mm. on the deck. And it was pretty um, uh, sort of uh, open as to what got on. And if someone had a choice they wanted to do it, one didn't stand in their way. Mm. Okay, you do that and I'll do this kind of deal. Which led to some successes and some things that shouldn't have gone on yeah. possibly. And did you did the individual sort of directors tend to champion specific writers, or it was more um, you know ad hoc who was available? No, I think um, Ken Hall was very interested in in Jim McNeil's plays, for instance, and did a couple of those. Uh, I did a couple of Williamson's. I did about four or five. I did a couple of. I think I must have done about eight of Ron B Blair's plays when I look back on it. Um, some one actors and some full length pieces, both at Nimrod and in other theatres. Uh, so we did kind of attach ourselves to a writer, but not necessarily uh, hard and fast. Mm. There was a bit of swapping around there as well. Yeah. Nobody claimed this is my writer or, you know, hands off. Yeah. There wasn't yeah. that kind of possessive. And did, was there still a house style? Did it, did it evolve or did it sort of dissipate in terms of that? I think the house style was kind of imposed on us by the building itself. Um, you can see the stables today as mm. a nice little informal space. In those days, it was much rougher. Mm. Uh, there was a post in the middle of the stage, for instance, to hold the roof up. So all those early scripts will say, I'll see you down by the tree, or uh, let's meet over here by the gallows, or uh, let's, let's stand here at this lamp post. There's always a reference to that <laughs> post in all the scripts. Um, and the roof was much lower, people were crammed in. So the, it was a and bring your own cushion kind of deal. Mm. Um, so, so, so you couldn't have pretensions. You couldn't have anything yeah. terribly grand. It, the, 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 the space dictated a certain looseness and casualness that was, I think, advantageous to all the work, even when we were doing our Shakespeare plays or other uh, avant-garde pieces from, from Europe. Uh, the same kind of um, informal approach, I think, enhanced the experience mm. rather than uh, worked against it. Did the ideas in the plays get bigger? I mean, it sounds simplistic, but do you think the scale at which you could conceive of work directorially or as a writer or were there always big you know big work going on in in even the stable space um you it, it's possible that our, our, <laughs> our, our minds expanded when we saw the bigger space <laughs> um, but we did do hamlet for instance in yeah. the old stables we're taking on some pretty heavy stuff um, and the content of some of those early plays i'm thinking of the rombrel stuff for instance it was pre pretty mm. pretty uh, intense but I think maybe when we saw that bigger space, um, we started to think bigger in terms of production values necessarily. Mm. And possibly with that came um, an expansion of, of uh, the, the content. But then again, we'd, in Downstairs Belvoir, we did pieces like Stephen Sewell's Traitors, for instance, and mm. Upside Down at the Bottom of the World, pieces that had fairly big vision mm. and yet were done in a con very confined space. So. Yeah. Um, it's interesting how that model, that shape, has become, mm. has proliferated as a, a quite a, quite an Australian stage. You know, I would. You I think the Belvoir stage. Well, the stable, the kite. The stables. You know that yeah. that shape. And then of course the Fairfax and. Well, Vid Fraser went on then to, de to design the Wharf Theatre, mm. so he he modelled the Wharf, uh, Wharf Two, not Wharf One, the yeah. big one, very much on uh, what he'd done at Belvoir. Yeah. So yeah, it did proliferate somewhat. Yeah, it's a very, yeah, it strikes me as very it's egalitarian in some sense. It is egalitarian. Yeah. It's a successful space and, and fairly flexible. I think the wharf one was what, perhaps the least flexible of all the spaces, but it's being demolished now, so we'll yeah. for something better. But it's amazing <laughs> how flexible that the Belvoir and the stables can be. And those discussions about what the space was or brought to the, sh to the company and its works, when you changed venues, was, was there some attempt to sort of keep as some of that energy, some of that, we, at least we did, the stage we, shape and things like that. We did try to keep much of that same. It had worked so well for us and become so much part of our identity um, that when the, the architect Viv Fraser saw the, the the Belvoir Street space, he 
tried in many ways to replicate what the Nimrod uh, advantages were mm. while cancelling out some of the some of the, the handicaps. So that kind of kite-shaped stage and the audience on on three sides uh, as it was at Belvoir, that was very much let's keep that relationship with the audience. Let's not have an end stage and back-to-back mm. -back seating. Let's avoid that and try and have this three-quarter round yeah. horseshoe kind of atmosphere. And do you think as the company formalized or you know expanded into bigger venues and did, how do you think that affected the work that was developing or, or the relationship with the writers themselves? Well there was still room for that kind of roughhouse theatre I've just described and I was delighted the other week to go and see Calamity Jane in that space. It took me right back. That was exactly the kind of theatre that we, that we loved back in the 1970s and were doing and here it was alive and well on the Belvoir stage. So that space still has that magic quality and can produce that kind of audience interreaction with the actors mm. marvellously that I think no other theatre in Sydney can do to that extent. So that's fine. But the fact that uh, the space was a bit more formal and that we were trying to attract a more you know, um, discriminating audience meant that the, the quality of the writing had to, to lift mm. for everybody's sake. We wanted more, um, you know, sort of um, uh, script with more longevity than just one short season. Yeah. And to go into issues that were uh, significant. So people like Stephen Sewell, for instance, you couldn't call Stephen frivolous <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Right. So we were looking for content and David Williamson's plays um, uh, it became more polished and more um, you know, less kind of knockabout. Mm. Um, so yes, there certainly was a, an attempt to keep that, uh, that same relationship with the audience, but perhaps provide more, um, you know, depth of, mm. of, in content and in in um, if the finished article, rather than uh, that that'll, it's ready to go on now. Let's throw it on. Yeah, we were, we were more scrupulous about the end product. And what did that look like? I mean, was there you know, ever workshops or, you know, how, how, does, how does one develop writers well, in that theatre at that time? How do you yeah. Uh, we, we wouldn't, we're not um, up to scratch on having development workshops. We'd, we'd allow a little more discussion time and we'd, we'd take more time to discuss with the writer and ask for rewrites or second or third drafts. We, we didn't have the, the capacity to do um, what you might call formal workshops of new plays. Mm. Uh, we'd ask for second or third drafts and we'd have longer discussions with the writers rather than say, let's just whack it on, it's ready to go. So we were more demanding, I suppose, about having a, a fully polished, finished product that mm. we thought was ready to go on stage. Uh, we had writers in residence from early on and we were certainly trying to encourage uh, writing. Um, and we were taking, of course, plays from other companies that we weren't just doing all original work. We were taking scripts that had been done in other companies. So it's an, it sounds like it's an, an interesting balance between, you know, investing time in some way in, in writers and the writing culture and also still making sure you're maintaining, you know, the output. When, when and why do you think the, the shift uh, to expand not just new writing and into classics and other things, was that a conscious decision again? Was that something that just sort of happened by programming? Um, it, it happened fairly early on. Uh, even in the old stables, uh, Richard Werrett, for instance, did uh, some of Peter Handke's plays, mm. like Caspar, and um, the other one I forget the title of it, um, but a couple of his plays. Uh, so we were doing stuff that was a bit avant-garde and European, as well as uh, a Shakespeare every year. Mm. That was largely because of my interest in, in Shakespeare. Richard Werrett shared that interest, so we co-directed co Hamlet together. Was that because you think it was unsustainable to keep the, pumping yeah. out? Well, not pumping out. Um, from fairly early on, we were not, not, we were not just doing home, homegrown pieces. We, we soon ran out of material. We were trying to do six or seven plays, mm -hmm. and eventually even more each year, when we had the upstairs and downstairs running at, at uh, Belvoir Street. We, there wasn't enough stuff coming through uh, all the time. So we, uh, we had an interest in doing avant-garde plays, which we did even back in the old stables. Richard Guerrero did some ha Peter Handkeep plays, for instance. Uh, and we were doing plays that uh, were established in rep repertoire. Uh, we did a Shakespeare because uh, that was my, one of my chief interests and Richard Guerrero's. Um, and um, we also started to do stuff 
that had some particular significance for the director. So Ken was interested in uh, encouraging black writers, and his one of his earliest productions was basically black, with an Aboriginal um, actors and writers. Um, and uh, then the, the Jim McNeil plays that Ken had sussed out. Uh, Jim McNeil was uh, serving time that we taught on, put on two of his plays uh, and then more we were shifted to Belvoir Street. So we did start to look for pieces that had um, some personal resonance for the directors or that suited our own particular tastes or interests. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting, I think those initial plays that, that seem to grapple with uh, the colony or England or taboos, not taboos, but, but were, you know, revolutionary because of their, their content and form. I wonder if it's, it's it, hard for us looking back to remember that there was you know, censorship in the stages and that there was still a lot of sacred, you know, there's a lot of issues that were sacred to a lot of, you know, Australian culture. And so do you think part of the success was that it, it spoke out and about and loudly about things that would uh, otherwise have been kept quiet? I guess so, I, but I don't think that it was anything that was dreadfully conf uh, um, confrontational mm. about those plays. I mean, uh, you take a piece like Flash Jim Vo about the convict era. Well, it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't kind of radical in its in its comment. It was a, li a light-hearted approach to the the convict system, mm. for instance. I think things like Basically Black um, were more confrontational. Um, we didn't have, I think, any women writers in the earliest days. They just either they didn't exist, or we hadn't found them, or weren't looking for them. But that whole thing came along a lot later mm. to go looking for uh, female writers and talking about uh, you know uh, women's issues. That's a, a much later development. Yeah. The, the theatre when we started was still pretty blokey. If you look at the Williamson plays and Buzo mm. and Romerill, they were written by men and largely about the ugly Australian ethos. In terms of your audience, it seemed uh, my impression is that Nimrod attracted a loyal uh, audience quite early and they, they continued to, you know. Did that help with the new writing? That helped sort of cushion works that otherwise m might not have been, you know, able to sell just on their own merits? Is there a hunger for, the, for new work I in the audience? I think uh, a hunger developed for it. Um, and I'd have to give David Williamson a lot of the credit for that. I mean, his plays um, were fresh, they were new, they caught the idiom in a way that nobody else had managed to do since Ray Lawler, mm. way back. Um, and they also had a very popular appeal. They weren't just for the, the arty set. They did appeal to a wide commercial audience. Mm. And that's why they were taken up by people like Harry Miller, for instance, and became commercial pieces. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you think, it, do you see any benefit in the method that, that of just th you're throwing things on? We were talking earlier about kind of, you know, the balance of work just getting on and versus work having you know, time and space? And um, I don't see any method in any, any virtue in just throwing a piece on before mm -hmm. it's ready. Uh, I think that's probably counterproductive, uh, especially if you do it um, in front of critics mm. and the media and so on. I think you're doing a disservice to the play and the writer. Um, what may have been, we might have got away with it back then, but I think no, now I'd be all encouraging for plays to get proper gestation period and proper uh, mentoring. Mm and uh, make sure they're as good as they can be before they go on. Because yeah. it's a disservice not just to the playwright and, the, and the, the play, but to the audience, I think, who will be soon become disillusioned when things that are half-baked or second-rate, mm. if you're trying to build a subscription audience and you know, build their loyalty, you've got to you know, put yourself to some pains to make sure you're giving them the best you, yeah. you can. Yeah. It might not be good enough, but the best you can do. I think that's really important, and yeah. I think that's what we still need more of in in Australia is those um, you know the, the facilities to workshop and play doctor and test run things before you really expose them to mm. the mainstream. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I suppose just um, lastly, I suppose for you as a director, you know, you, a significant portion of your early work was new writing. Mm. You know, you've moved more deeply into your passion, obviously, for Shakespeare. How did your process evolve, or would you do you approach those works differently because they're new? Do you treat them just the, the same as a as a work of 
Shakespeare? Yes, yes, I, I always tried to, uh, and I, I do love doing new work, and I've done quite a lot looking back over the period, and I would do it again tomorrow if mm. I was offered a new play to do, I would do it. Uh, my, my passion for Shakespeare doesn't doesn't uh, yes mutually exclusive doesn't rub out <laughs> my um, you know enthusiasm for new writing. I think it's really exciting, and to get a hold of a really good new script is the, the biggest thrill you can have. I think, but as for the way I approached them, I always worked off the the um, idea that I would treat Shakespeare as if it was a new play, and it wasn't. I, d I didn't want to know its baggage and its heritage and its history and all that stuff, all the stuff that goes with it but to try and look at it freshly as if there was a brand new play. And to treat a, a new play um, as carefully and uh, as, in as much depth as if I were doing a, a, a classic, just to try and get the most out of the language and dig out whatever subtext there was. And you know, there shouldn't be any difference between doing a, a Shakespeare or a Beckett or a Williamson or whatever, that mm. give them all equal um, attention, I suppose. Mm. And yeah. probe as deep as you can and see what, what you can come up with. Yeah, it's fantastic. Probably my work uh, as an actor in Chekhov has encouraged that, because I've done quite a lot of Chekhov. And when you work with a good director on Chekhov and realise that it's all about subtext and all about what's under the words, mm. that's very informative. And you can apply that to Shakespeare or any new writing mm. and say, OK, that's the service. What else is underneath that mm. that we can dig into and, and present? I remember not really getting Chekhov, not, not, just not resonating with it until I learnt more you know, about his love of actors. Mm -hmm. you know, that he was a bit like Shakespeare, you know, he, he knew who he was writing for and he cared, he was excited by them, I think. Yeah. And, you know, once you sort of read, once you feel that yeah. care and excitement for knowing well, what actors can do. But they're so different, dynamically so imposed yeah. in terms of technique. Shakespeare puts it all out there and gives you everything. Yeah. Chekhov gives you just a hint yeah. and you've got to really say, hang on, what, what's underneath that? Yeah. Where's the irony? Where is the contradiction in that? Yeah, and that's that's uh, fascinating. Yeah, it's so. But if you can apply that to any any play, it it, it pays off.